So as many of you know, tomorrow is a very important day. Six more states will be voting. This includes Michigan, which is crucial, Washington State, Mississippi. But regardless of what happens tomorrow, Bernie Sanders will continue on in this primary. He has enough resources, funds, and grassroots organizers to stay in all the way until the convention. And we are going to be fighting to make sure that Joe Biden is not the nominee because in the event he wins, Donald Trump is going to get a second term. That is almost a guarantee because Joe Biden is such a weak candidate. However, since we are in this for the long haul, since Bernie isn't going anywhere, I don't believe that we kind of just sit back and tell ourselves that we did everything right. It's really important that we be introspective and we try to figure out as it happens what's going wrong for us, what's going right for us, and how we can adjust our strategy going forward. And one thing that I must say is that Bernie Sanders, he has phenomenal policies. He is someone who I agree with on almost everything. Not every single policy, but almost everything. And in terms of just policy itself, we haven't had a candidate this left wing in American history that's been this close to actually becoming the Democratic Party nominee. So he's great when it comes to policy. However, when it comes to strategy, that's where we've, we've really got to take a hard look in the mirror and understand what we can do differently. And when it comes to Bernie Sanders, he has got to really make a decision here. Either he is going to continue to play nice with the Democratic Party establishment and specifically Joe Biden and lose, or he's actually going to toughen up and go at them really hard and give them hell and win. Because going forward, I can't see a path to victory for us if we continue carrying about the same way that we've been carrying on throughout the course of this primary. And I'll give you a couple of examples. So Bernie Sanders uh, was talking to basically everyone on the Sunday shows, which is great. You've got to promote your agenda. You've got to, you know, contrast differences between yourself and Joe Biden. But he's too nice to Joe Biden. Here's an example. You know, if you're talking about taking on Trump and defeating Trump and Joe understands and I understand that we have got to do everything possible to defeat Trump. And I'll support Joe if he wins. He'll support me if I win. Uh, but going into states like Michigan, going into Pennsylvania, going into Wisconsin, key battleground states, these are all states that have been devastated by these terrible trade agreements. And I fear very much, you know, if Joe is the candidate, believe me, Trump will and has already talked about Joe's record on trade. I believe that we are the strongest campaign to defeat Donald Trump, A, because we have a grassroots movement that is unparalleled, B, because we have a voting record that speaks to the needs of working families. I believe that the United States has got to join every other major country on earth, guarantee health care to all people as a human right, help lead the effort on that, help lead the effort to raise the minimum wage to 15 bucks an hour, help lead the effort to demand that at a time of massive income and wealth inequality, the rich and the billionaire class start paying their fair share of taxes. Senator, are you saying that uh, Joe Biden will lose Michigan and other industrial Midwest states uh, to President Trump if he's the nominee? No, I'm not saying that. And I've been asked that a million times, and I believe Joe can beat uh, Trump. And if, if Joe is the candidate, I'll do everything I can to make sure that he does. But I think just looking at the facts, uh, if you're going into the industrial base of the United States of America, the heartland of America, and you voted for agreements that have devastated communities, like Flint, Detroit, uh, it is going to hard to make the case when Trump has made trade such an important part of his agenda. Now, Trump lies all of the time. I mean, he is a pathological liar, he's running a corrupt administration. But it will be hard, I believe, not to say that he can't do it, but it will be hard for Joe to defend a record uh, on trade when it has had such a, a, a negative impact on the Midwest. I love you to death, Bernie. Um, I think you're a fantastic person. But you're being too nice. You're being too nice. And you can hear it in his voice. Like when he talks about Joe Biden, he always has to qualify every statement with some compliment about Joe Biden. Oh, he's my friend. He's a nice person. And then when he actually gets to the criticism of Joe Biden, you can tell that he's walking on eggshells. Like he's tiptoeing around the criticism instead of just directly saying it. When that's not effective, like this is a fight for our lives, literally. And we are counting on you, Bernie, to win this. So if you are going to be nice to Joe Biden like that, it's just it, you're not helping 
any of us. So he said, look, I believe Joe Biden can beat Donald Trump. And if Joe's the candidate, I'll do everything I can to make sure that he does. Except Joe Biden cannot beat Donald Trump. If he's the nominee, Donald Trump is going to easily beat him. He's already, you know, previewing some of these general election, election attacks on Joe Biden. And they're going to be effective. There's, they're going to resonate. And here's the thing. Hillary Clinton was a weak candidate. Joe Biden is exponentially weaker than Hillary Clinton, exponentially more vulnerable, less charismatic than Hillary Clinton. So everything that we thought about Hillary Clinton, we all kind of thought, well, there's nobody that the Democratic Party can run that would be worse than Hillary Clinton. Actually, it's Joe Biden, because there's nothing that will excite voters. You can't really even cite a single policy that he supports. At least with Hillary Clinton, there was that excitement about the fact that, you know, she'd be the first woman president. But with Joe Biden, there's zero excitement. So you've got to sound the alarm, Bernie. You've got to make it very clear for people who are watching that if we nominate Joe Biden, we're handing Donald Trump the presidency for another four years. Now, part of what I, I think is happening is that Bernie Sanders is genuinely worried that the Democratic Party is going to blame him for President Trump's electoral victory, right? They did this in 2016, and he doesn't want that to happen again, except what's going to happen is a foregone conclusion. You will be blamed. We will be blamed. What's going to happen is the Democratic Party if they nominate Joe Biden, they're going to lose and blame the left. And then, you know, in 2024, 2028, they're going to expect to uh, win with the same strategy and say how much, you know, we, we've got to have a moderate and that's important. We can't run too far to the left. So they're not going to learn anything and they're not going to welcome you with open arms if you play, you know, their game and you hold hands and sing Kumbaya with them. That's just never going to happen. So you can't play their game. Now, I want to play another clip for you where I think Bernie Sanders has got a course correct here because what he says in his criticism of Joe Biden, it's too soft and he just, he struggles to just come out and be mean. And I get that he's a really nice person, but this is an election and Joe Biden is a disaster. He is a disaster. So listen to what Bernie Sanders says in his criticism of Joe Biden. Senator, since Super Tuesday, you've been going after Joe Biden pretty hard on a number of issues. Take a look. One of us in this race led the opposition to the war in Iraq. One of us led the opposition to disastrous trade agreements. One of us has spent his entire life fighting against cuts in Social Security. Senator, now that this is a two-man race and you're going to have a two-man debate next Sunday, how hard do you go after Joe Biden without carving each other up and helping Donald Trump win re-election? Well, Chris, that's, that's the right question. Joe Biden is a friend of mine. Joe Biden is a decent guy. What Joe has said is if I win the nomination, he'll be there for me. And what I have said, if he wins the nomination, I'll be there for him because we both recognize that we have a president who is a pathological liar, and I say that without any joy in my heart, uh, somebody who's running a corrupt administration, and somebody apparently who has never read the Constitution of the United States and thinks he's above the law. So Biden and I, no matter who wins this thing, will be together in defeating Trump. But now that it is a two-way race, it is important for the voters of this country to ask themselves two questions. Number one, which candidate is stronger in terms of being able to defeat Trump. And number two, what are the differences in a record? Joe has been in Washington for a long time, as have I. And my point is, when people see the records, Joe voted for the war in Iraq, I opposed the war in Iraq. Joe voted for the Wall Street bailout, I vigorously opposed the Wall Street bailout. When you go to the Midwest, we're in Michigan right now, you go to Wisconsin, you go to Pennsylvania, people want to know about your views on trade. Because disastrous trade agreements like NAFTA and PNTR with China cost this country over four million good paying jobs, decimated communities here in Michigan. So I helped lead the opposition to those trade agreements. Joe voted for them. You have to stop saying that Joe Biden is your friend. Whenever Joe Biden criticizes you, he's very smug, he's very arrogant, and it's effective. He never says, you know what, Bernie Sanders is my friend, but here's X, Y, and Z reasons why you should vote for me over him. He never says that. And then, you know, we've heard the same song and dance from Bernie Sanders over and over again. He prefaces his criticism of Joe Biden by saying, look, I really like Joe Biden. He's such a nice person. But, you know, when it comes to the Iraq war and his trade deals, he'd be a disaster. 
Except first and foremost, you can't be nice to Joe Biden like that. You've got to hit him and let people know what's at stake here. We are going to lose to Trump if he's the nominee. And second of all, this is a very different race. And what I want Bernie Sanders to acknowledge is that he's got to change up the strategy because he's won on the policy. And when I say he's won on the policy, I mean he's convinced Democratic Party primary voters that his ideas are are the best ideas. I mean, look at some of these exit polls and just take a look at this article from Common Dreams. It says, in every Super Tuesday state with exit polls, majority of Democratic voters support eliminating private insurance. And when you look at these exit polls here, even states where Joe Biden demolished Bernie Sanders, Medicare for all still won with large margins. It still got at least 50%. So we've won on the policy. We've won on the policy. So now what people are clearly voting based on is who they think can beat Donald Trump. So by you simply drawing policy differences between you and Joe Biden, that's not enough. You have to connect that, connect it to his weakness in a general election. Because the entire time, the Democratic Party establishment and media apparatus, to be fair, has made this a race about electability. And Bernie Sanders started to really get the messaging right there, but never was sharp enough. He has to make it very clear that this is about electability. If you want to play by electability, fine. We just ran Hillary Clinton a moderate and lost. Moderates lose all the time. Look at uh, John Kerry in 2004, Hillary Clinton in 2016. Do you want to roll the dice again? It is progressives who win. Barack Obama won by campaigning as a strong progressive. Now, you can argue that he didn't live up to those progressive ideals, but regardless, he ran a progressive campaign and won. So if you want to excite the base, you have to be progressive. And Joe Biden isn't offering voters anything, and they're going to stay home because they don't really perceive there to be any real difference that's meaningful between Joe Biden and Donald Trump. You've got to stress this. And for Bernie Sanders to still say the same thing that he said a couple of months ago, it's not going to work. Now, going forward, Bernie has to change that. And here's what I really want to stress. Bernie has got to understand that he has to play hardball with the establishment. Nothing that he can ever, there's nothing he can say or do that's going to win them over and get them to appreciate his contribution to electoral politics. There's no way that he can win them over. You have to defeat them. You have to crush them because that's what they're trying to do to you, Bernie Sanders. That's what they're trying to do to you. And they're being successful because they have a lot of institutional advantages. So you've got to take back the messaging. And part of the reason why I want Bernie Sanders to harden up is because anything that he grants, any concession he makes to the establishment, they're never going to make that same concession to him. So just, you know, a week ago, before Super Tuesday, when it seemed very clear that Bernie Sanders you know, if he didn't win an outright majority, he was the front runner to get a plurality of pledged delegates going into the convention. Well, what did Joe Biden say about that? As this headline from Vox points out, Biden says he'll contest the Democratic nomination if no one gets a majority of delegates. If Sanders leads in delegates but doesn't have a majority, Biden said he'll fight for the nomination. Now contrast that with this headline from Newsweek where Bernie Sanders says he'll drop out if Biden gets a plurality coming into the Democratic convention. Now I'm not saying that Bernie Sanders plays dirty to the extent that he is going to try to convince superdelegates to steal the nomination away from Biden, Biden if he gets more votes, um, because I think that's just, that's just undemocratic. But what I want to point to here is the problem that Bernie Sanders has in giving up his leverage, right? You have so much leverage right now. You have so much leverage and you're giving it up when you don't have to. Like, what you can do, even if it is going to lead to nothing, you can say, I'm not going anywhere. I will contest this convention unless we have a Democratic nominee who believes in Medicare for all. Because in every single state, Medicare for all won. So if I'm not at the top of the ticket, we need someone who supports Medicare for all. So I'm not dropping out unless Joe Biden unequivocally is on tape saying, I will fight for Medicare for all and introduce a bill on uh, day one. Now, we don't have to believe him. We don't have to believe that he's going to fight for it at all because I don't think that he will. Health stocks shot up after Super Tuesday when he was victorious. But what you have to do is understand the immense amount of leverage that you have and use it to your advantage. Like part of the reason why the Republican establishment in 2016 couldn't 
fuck over Donald Trump was because Donald Trump was willing to play hardball. I mean, think about this. When there was talk of a contested convention to try to steal the nomination away from Donald Trump, what did Donald Trump do back in 2016 or 2015 more specifically? He said, I'm going to run third party. I'm going to run third party, right? That's what you have to do. And even if you don't believe that, don't give away your leverage. And I, I want to say this to voters as well, because everyone is so quick to say, you know what? Sure, I'll support Joe Biden. I hate him. Here's all the criticisms, but I'll support him if he's the nominee. Even if that's true, you can't give away your leverage. You have to make the Democratic Party establishment fearful. You have to make them realize that if they don't vote for the person who's the strongest against Donald Trump, they're going to lose. They can't just, you know, expect to keep doing the same thing and getting our support. Like, you've got to let them know that your power will be exercised in a way that isn't going to help them. But I see so many people, like, so willing to fall in line and say, well, of course, you know, I'm saying all this about Biden now, but I'll vote for him. Don't say that yet, even if you're going to do that. And the same is true for Bernie Sanders. Like, here's a problem with electoral politics and why the left loses. Since so much is at stake, you know, and... I think that a lot of the left rightfully believes in harm reduction. We want to make sure that we make it clear we're compassionate. Like, we're not going to do anything that hurts people more so than they're already being hurt. But at the same time, you need leverage. You have to use the power that you have, the minimal amount of power that you have in electoral politics to make it very clear that the establishment cannot continue to steamroll you. And you're not just going to get up and fall in line and support them. Like, even if... You plan on voting for Joe Biden if he's the nominee. Don't say that right now. Don't say that right now. You're in a primary and the Democratic Party is going to put up someone that overall is going to lose to Donald Trump. I mean, it. look, all of us who follow politics, it doesn't matter what we do. What matters is what the average person, the disaffected non-voter does. And if they see that it's between Joe Biden and Donald Trump and they don't really think there's a true difference between these two people, they don't believe their lives are going to change and it's not worth standing in line for five to six hours, they're just going to stay home, right? And nothing you say or do will be able to convince them. Voter apathy is a real problem. It's a real problem that we have to deal with. So what I want people to understand on the left is that we have leverage. We just have to know how to use it and stop giving it away and play hardball. Stop trying to get the Democratic Party to like us. Stop trying to court them. We need to be in a position to where they're courting us. They're trying to win us over. And it's not the other way around. And, you know, the media plays us like fiddles sometimes. I've got to admit that. I mean, with this whole Elizabeth Warren thing and, you know, the snake emojis, the way that they set this up was that we are the ones who are supposed to be courting Elizabeth Warren for an endorsement. When think about this, this is someone who wants to run for president in 2024. She's a multimillionaire white woman. She's going to be perfectly fine. But we're supposed to be really nice right now to Elizabeth Warren. And we're supposed to court her and send her positive messages in this time of grieving. We are the ones who have leverage. Without us, the Democratic Party can never win another election again. Now, if you don't want to play hardball like that, if you don't want to be dirty, that's fine. But understand, if you give away your leverage, then the Democratic Party is essentially going to realize they can crush you and it's not going to hurt their chances, electorally speaking right? You're telling them, you know what? It's okay if you rig it. It's okay if you crush me. At the end of the day, I'm going to fall in line like a good little soldier and support the Democratic nominee, regardless of who it is. I mean, if you put up a clone of Donald Trump with a D next to his name, I'll support that individual because I believe that, you know, harm reduction is the best strategy. And you may be right about that, but there's a time and place for all of that. If you are going to fall in line, there's a time and place for that. Now is not the time. Now is the time to absolutely be disruptive and loud and make it very clear that the Democratic Party establishment doesn't control you. You are a free agent and you're going to make a decision that's best for you. And voting for Joe Biden is not an option and you will not vote for Joe Biden. Even if you are, say you won't right now. Do you understand what I'm what I'm talking about? Like we just we have to acknowledge that if we're going to really focus on electoral politics and be hyper focused on it like we have been on the left, then we can't play nice with the Democratic Party establishment. And this, you know, going back to Bernie Sanders, this is true for him as well. You have to make it very clear 
that you're going to play hardball with them and they're going to hate you, but that's fine because they're never going to love you. It doesn't matter what you say or do. You will never win them over. They will always hate you. The media will always hate Bernie Sanders and they'll use him in, you know, a, a few years to their advantage for ratings and whatnot, but they're never going to love him because capital at the end of the day will always do what's best for capital. It's not going to roll over and die. You can't be nice enough to the capitalists and win them over. You've got to fight as hard as you possibly can. And even if we fight really hard, it still might not be enough. But know that we did it by being as fierce and ferocious and relentless as we possibly can be. And we didn't give them permission to fuck us over, essentially. We didn't give up our leverage when it was too early. So this is just, you know, to kind of summarize this and wrap this entire message in a bow. Bernie really, as much as I love him, we've got to show him tough love and let him know Playing nice with Joe Biden is unacceptable at this point in time. If you want to win, you can't be nice. You can't say Joe Biden can beat Donald Trump. Maybe Bernie believes that, but he's not going to beat Donald Trump, right? And you've got to make it very clear what's at stake. If voters care about electability, you have to make it clear that Joe Biden is unelectable. He's unelectable. Use whatever you can. The Hunter Biden controversy and that conflict of interest, Joe Biden's cognitive decline, because these are things that aren't just going to go away if we don't talk about them, right? There are some things that you can't touch, that the Democratic Party establishment will screech at the top of their lungs if you talk about it. But guess what? Trump's going to talk about it. And that's regardless if we talk about it or not. Like, if we don't say it, it's not like Donald Trump will just say, oh, well, since Democrats didn't talk about Hunter Biden scandal, I can't talk about that. They're going to talk about it. Now, I get that Bernie doesn't want to be blamed for basically giving this attack to Republicans as he was blamed for attacks against Hillary Clinton with corruption. But you've got to understand, the Republican Party will do whatever they can to win. They are ruthless. And if we just adopt a fraction of their ruthlessness, our odds will improve drastically. So all that I'm saying is we can't be nice. Nice guys finish last, Bernie. And we've got to play hardball with the establishment and we've got to absolutely give them hell, be loud, be disruptive, because if we don't, we just can't win. That's our only chance is being fighters and not backing down, not giving away our leverage. If we have a shot, that's our only shot is being tough. And I really hope that going forward, Bernie Sanders acknowledges the importance of this and, you know, he tries to step out of his comfort zone and actually be really fierce in his criticisms of Joe Biden because reiterating time and again that he's your friend is not convincing voters. You know, you're making the case for him by saying, well, you disagree with Biden on policy, but he's such a nice guy. You're not helping yourself. You've got to be tough if we want a chance.